All right, it's a pleasure to introduce Jason Miller from Cambridge, uh, who will talk today about uh, Leoville quantum gravity. Okay, thanks. Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here today, uh, at least virtually. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about uh, at various points is going to involve uh, some work that I've done in collaboration with uh, Ewan Gwynn, uh, who is there in Chicago, so I guess everybody knows, um, and also uh, Scott Sheffield from, uh, from MIT. Um, so this is, this is going to be a probability talk, and I'm going to be focusing on uh, random phenomena in two dimensions. Um, so just to begin, uh, I want to start off by uh, reminding you or telling you um, you know, what are some of the important objects that one studies uh, in this area? And the most central one and famous one is, is just planar Brownian motion, which you can think of uh, in a certain sense as being a canonical uh, model for a random uh, planar curve. Um, and then there's also something called the schramm lovin revolution. Um, and this is a random curve in the plane like Brownian motion, but it has the additional constraint uh, that it can't uh, cross itself with a non-self crossing curve. Um, and then there's something called the continuum random tree, which is uh, in a certain sense, a canonical model for uh, a random planar tree. And it appears in many contexts. And the main uh, object that I'm going to be focusing on today is something called Leoville quantum gravity. And I'm going to try to explain uh, a little bit about why you can think of this as a canonical model for a random surface. And then somehow underlying some of the things I'm going to be talking about are connections between, um, between everything else. Um, OK. So um, one final comment is that on this slide, uh, I only made the picture on the top left. So that was the easy one. Uh, so the other pictures were made by, by these people that I've, I've listed um, below. Um, OK. So one of the, the questions which really motivates what I'm going to be talking about is how, sh how should one go about trying to make sense of what would be the, the way of picking a surface uh, uniformly at random, which is homeomorphic to the, uh, to the sphere. Um, and there have been um, a couple of different approaches for this problem which have been developed. Uh, one approach is based on discretizing the question and this uh, has to do with what are called random planar maps. And this is uh, a subject which is really rooted in things that were developed in combinatorics uh, going back to the 1960s when uh, Tutt wrote a series of papers where he uh, enumerated various types of planar maps. Um, and then there's another theory of, um, of random surfaces, which was developed in a very different context and in the continuum. And this is something called Leoville quantum gravity and this comes from uh, some literature in the physics back in the 1980s. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what these things are, uh, how they're related to each other, and some applications that can come out of this. Um, so before I get into that, uh, let me just take uh, a moment to say a few more words about uh, Brownian motion. So one way of thinking about what Brownian motion is in the plane is it's the uniform measure on curves um, which live in the plane, the uniform measure on continuous planar curves. Now, whenever one makes a statement like that, uh, it always requires some interpretation because this doesn't make literal sense. And one way of making this precise is you can discretize the question. And um, you can say that it arises as the scaling limit of certain types of uniformly random uh, discrete paths. Um, in particular, um, you can consider uh, simple random walks. So you imagine that you have uh, a nice planar graph, like for example, you could have the two-dimensional integer lattice, Z2, and then a simple random walk is just a particle on Z2, which is going up, down, left, or right with equal probability in each time step. And, and then one of the, uh, the basic results that you learn in a, um, you know, a first graduate course in probability is that if you take the simple random walk path and you rescale uh, spatially by the factor one over root n and then time by the factor n, then in the limit you get a Brownian motion. And so, you know, because a simple rock random walk path of length n is exactly a uniformly random uh, discrete curve, you can think of Brownian motion as a uniformly random continuous curve because it arises as a scaling limit um, in this way. Um, 
Okay, so now uh, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about how one thinks about this question in the context of, of surfaces rather than just curves. And, and here the uh, discrete object, rather than being a random walk, is going to be, um, is going to be something called a random planar map. Um, so first of all, what is a planar map? Uh, so let me just remind you that this is just a graph which has an embedding in the plane so that no two edges cross. And when one talks about planar maps, you view these uh, embedded graphs as being defined module of some kind of a continuous deformation of the plane. So in other words, if I were to take, say, this uh, vertex here that I'm highlighting, and I were to kind of slide it down there and maybe take this edge and bend it there like that in kind of a continuous way, then this would still be the same, same planar map. And um, this particular planar map that I've drawn for you is a quadrangulation, because if you look at any of the faces, uh, like this one here, it has exactly four adjacent sides. So these, uh, these are its, um, its sides. And, and then the way that you can think of a quadrangulation is corresponding to a surface is you take um, each one of its faces and you identify it with a copy of the usual uh, you know, unit square, the one by one square. And you have one, one square for each uh, face in your planar map. So maybe you have a picture that looks like this. And then uh, the way you build your surface out of these squares is you're just going to glue together your, uh, your squares according to the adjacency relation of the map. So the bottom of this square is going to be glued to the top of that one. And the right side of this one is glued to the left side of that one, uh, et cetera. And when you glue things together in this way, you're going to get a, a discrete surface, which is uh, going to be homeomorphic uh, to the sphere. Um, so to make this maybe a little bit more concrete, let me give you uh, another way of thinking about this. Um, so another way of constructing the same type of object is you can imagine that you start off with a sheet of paper and then you, um, you get out your, your pen and your ruler and then you uh, mark uh, on your sheet of paper a bunch of squares of equal size. So here it looks like I've got 12 of them. And then you, um, you get out your scissors and you cut your, your paper into these uh, 12 squares. And, and then once you've done that, you can uh, get out a bottle of glue and glue the squares back together. And you want to do it in such a way that you get something which is homeomorphic to the sphere. And if you start off with a finite number of squares, like these 12 here, there's only a finite number of ways of doing that. And so you can talk about picking one of these objects uh, uniformly at random. And this is the type of, of random planar map which gives rise to a random discrete surface. Um, and if you do this uh, properly, um, you get a picture uh, like this uh, piece of origami that I've, I've got here. Um, so this is a, you can think of this as being like a, a random quadrangulation, um, you know, with not very many faces. Um, when you look at this, you might think this is actually a triangulation and not a quadrangulation because you, you see kind of these uh, pointy things here, but all that's going on is that, you know, when you glue your squares together, there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking a square and you can always glue, let's say the, um, the left side of the square to the top of the square, that's perfectly allowed. And when you do that in, with a piece of paper in three dimensional space, it starts to look like a triangle, but in reality it's, it's a square. And the, one of the basic sort of questions is, uh, what does one of these um, random quadrangulations uh, look like when the number of faces is very, very large and in particular going to um, infinity? And you know, one sort of question that you have to answer before you can start to even study that one is just you know, how many quadrangulations are there with a given number of faces? And, and this is one of the things that actually Tut uh, addressed in his original series of papers on, on planar maps back in the 60s. And so he found this uh, amazingly simple looking formula that says that the, um, the number of quadrangulations with n faces uh, turns out to be given by, by that formula there on, on the right-hand side. Um, let me just show you one, one more picture. Um, so this is a, now a much larger simulation of a random quadrangulation. 
uh, this one has 25,000 faces. And, um, and then after sampling it, it was embedded into three-dimensional space. And when you embed these objects into three-dimensional space, it's going to be you know, not at all an isometric embedding. So there's going to be a lot of stretching and distorting. Um, but still, I, I really like looking at these pictures because you know, they remind us that when we pick surfaces at random, we're not going to get a smooth manifold. We're going to get something which is uh, a very rough and, and fractal um, object. And this particular simulation is due to uh, Jean-Francois Mackert. Um, and he's somebody who was uh, very much involved in the study of these things uh, around the last 20 or so, 20 or so years. Um, so I want to tell you now um, a little bit about um, some of the uh, basic results about large uniformly random quadrangulations. Um, so the first one is, if we uh, you know, view our quadrangulation as a metric space, so you've got your planar map together with its graph metric, um, then it turns out that it's possible to calculate uh, what the typical diameter, graph distance diameter is going to be. And this is a result that was due to uh, Schasing and Schaefer from the early 2000s. And it turns out that it's going to be of order n to the one quarter, okay? Um, and then building on this, um, it was proved by uh, Jean-Francois Legault that if you, if you take, again, your random quadrangulation with n faces and you take its uh, graph metric, but now you uh, rescale it by the factor n to the minus one quarter, which by the work of Chasing and Schaefer is the right rescaling to get something which is going to be of constant order, then he proved a compactness result, which states that um, you can take a subsequential limit of these probability measures, and you're going to get a non-trivial limit. And here, uh, the underlying topology is the gromov hausdorff topology, uh, which if you haven't seen it before, it's just a way of making sense of a distance on, on compact metric spaces, okay? So you can take a scaling limit, at least along subsequences, and this is kind of where things stood in the literature for a long time, um, but in the intervening years, uh, still some very interesting things were proved about these possible subsequential limits. Um, in particular, it was proved by Legal that the you know, random metric space you're going to get in a subsequential limit always has uh, dimension four in the sense of Hausdorff dimensions or like its metric dimension. Um, but at the same time, it's going to be uh, topologically a two-dimensional sphere. Um, so this, this, was, this last result was proved uh, in two works. There's one due to Legal and Paulin and an independent one by, by Gregory Miermont. And what this, this last point means is that, you know, if you look at this picture um, on this side, then you, you kind of see like a neck forming here, which looks like in the limit might pinch off and, and give you something which is not homeomorphic to the sphere, but really that's just an artifact of the way that the embedding was computed and those things don't happen in practice and so you really do get a random metric space, which is homeomorphic to the sphere. Um, and then there was a really big breakthrough. Uh, this was, I think, first announced, if I remember correctly, in 2011. Um, so there were these two independent works, uh, one by uh, Legal and the other one by, by Miermont, where they proved that you don't have to take a subsequential limit. You really do have a real limit of these probability measures and you get this thing, which is called the Brownian map. So the Brownian map is, it's a probability measure on the space of uh, metric spaces. And the reason they call it the Brownian map is because it's a limit of planar maps. And the Brownian part is because you can give a very explicit uh, construction of this uh, using Brownian motion. And, um, and this is actually part of a family of results. So you can consider, um, scaling limits of these types of random surfaces with other topologies. Uh, so for example, you can consider quadrangulations of the disk, the plane, the sphere, the half plane, et cetera. And they will also uh, converge in the limit. And these form the family of what are called uh, Brownian surfaces, okay? Now, one thing that I want to emphasize though is that uh, these surfaces are not embedded surfaces because um, the topology that we're taking a scaling limit in is just the Gromov-Hausdorff topology. Uh, 
which means that the limiting object is just going to be a metric space. And actually you can go a little bit further and you can also keep track of a natural measure because there's the, you know, the, the measure which just gives one unit of mass to say each vertex in your planar map. And then you're going to get a, a metric measure space. So that, that's, that's the structure that you have. Um, okay, so that's what the Brownian map is. So you can think of this in some sense as being the uniform measure on surfaces homeomorphic to the sphere. Now, um, before I jump into talking about Liouville quantum gravity, I want to tell you a little bit about the story of, of why one is actually interested in these objects uh, to begin with. Um, and so let me go back to my, uh, my Brownian motion. So this is the, a planar Brownian motion. And there was uh, a very famous conjecture about planar Brownian motion, which was due to Mandelbrot. And what he said, or what he conjectured is that the dimension of the outer boundary, which is this uh, red curve that you see here, is equal to four thirds. And you know, what that means is that if you were to try to cover your, the outer boundary of the Brownian motion by uh, disks of radius epsilon, then the number of them that you're going to need he conjectured was of order epsilon to the minus four thirds plus some lower order correction. And um, if you, you know, think about these questions for a while, um, you'll realize that to, to establish these kinds of fractal properties of Brownian motion, there's a particular thing which you need to study, which is you need to look at the, the following question. So you imagine that you have say uh, the disc of radius epsilon within the unit disc, and, and then what you're going to do is you're going to start um, a given number of Brownian motions from points on the, um, the inner disk of radius epsilon, which are chosen independently. So here I've got three of them. And, and then you, you run your Brownian motions until they make it to the, the boundary of the, um, of the unit disk. Now, because we're working in two dimensions, you know, two dimensional paths like to cross each other and so the very likely thing is that these Brownian motions will, will intersect. And, and what you want to know is how unlikely is it that your Brownian motions don't intersect? Um, and this looks like kind of an innocuous problem when you see it for the first time, but this is actually a very difficult probability to, to evaluate. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about the story of how it was done. Um, so the idea is that People working in physics who were looking at things like Brownian motions or other models from uh, statistical mechanics in two dimensions, they realized that these types of probabilities are a lot easier to calculate if your underlying geometry is random. Like for example, you're working on a random planar map. And so what happened in this particular case is this uh, physicist uh, whose name is Bertrand Duplantier. And this is a, a picture of him here. Um, relatively recent picture actually talking exactly about this topic. And he looked at this question of non-intersecting Brownian motions or non-intersecting random walks on a random quadrangulation. And he calculated uh, what these exponents are or how unlikely it is for them to uh, not intersect. And he computed them at least at the level of physics. So it's a non-rigorous derivation, but gives you the right answer. And, and this is not going to uh, correspond to what we wanted in the original setting because we're working on a different geometry, a random geometry. And, and then the physicists had a, another heuristic, which is called the KPZ relation, which is a way of taking these um, probabilities computed on random geometries and converting the, the answer that you get into uh, what you would want if you were working on just Euclidean space. So it takes into account the fact that there's sort of a change of metric going on here. Now, both of these steps are heuristic steps. So they just give you a conjecture as to what the right answer should be, in this case, for these Brownian motions. And then uh, what happened is the mathematicians come along. And in this case, it was uh, Greg Lawler, Odid Schramm, and Wendelin Werner. And they, they took as input this physics prediction and they proved it mathematically, but using a very, very different set of techniques. So they did it using the schramm lovin revolution that I mentioned um, at the beginning. Um, and there are lots of other examples where, um, you know, predictions from the physicists were made in this way, and then mathematicians try to prove them using, using other things like, like SLE. Uh, 
Um, okay, so this is what I wanted to say about um, random uh, quadrangulations. Uh, now let me move on to the other theory of random surfaces. Um, so this is Liouville quantum gravity. And the idea here, again, is one wants to, in a canonical way, try to make sense of a random surface. And in this setting, it's not going to be from the perspective of these discrete models, but rather you know, from the perspective of Ramanian geometry. So how do you pick a two-dimensional Ramanian manifold uh, at random? And, um, and there was a physicist uh, named Polyakov, or there is a physicist, he's still alive, um, who, who said that what you should do is you should pick a random metric by starting off with the Euclidean metric on a planar domain, and then you, you're going to perturb it by this conformal factor, e to the gamma h, where gamma is a parameter which goes between 0 and 2, so that's deterministic, and then the random thing is the h, and it's a random field called the Gaussian free field. So when gamma is equal to zero, this is just the Euclidean metric. And then you're considering a larger and larger perturbation of the uh, Euclidean metric when you make gamma bigger. Um, and what is, what is the Gaussian free field? Well, the very quickest way to get at it is it's a Gaussian field. So it's a, it's a random field on, a, on your planar domain where the covariance function is given by the Green's function for the Laplacian. And because we're working in, in two dimensions, um, the important thing is that this, uh, this covariance function blows up like the log function when, uh, when x gets uh, close to y. And this is a very important object in, in two-dimensional probability. Uh, it comes up in many different contexts, uh, not just in, in Liouville quantum gravity. And the reason for that is that it has um, a lot of important properties. Uh, so it behaves well when you apply conformal transformations. It's a Markovian random field. And it's also very much connected to, um, to the Brownian bridge. So in some sense, it's like a Brownian motion or a Brownian bridge where you have two time dimensions um, instead of one. And the kind of other context where it arises is um, just like Brownian motion is the scaling limit of lots of different types of random curves, uh, the Gaussian free field describes the fluctuations of many different types of random surface models or, or things like random matrices, um, et cetera. And so the reason that it's very natural to take the Euclidean metric and perturb it by the exponential of the Gaussian free field is that um, when you describe a metric in this way, you can write down a formula for its Gaussian curvature in terms of h. And it turns out that when the function, if, if uh, function h, if it's harmonic, then your, your, your uh, surface has zero curvature. And so it's like a flat domain. And there's a certain way of uh, thinking about the Gaussian free field, which says that it's kind of like the canonical uh, random perturbation of a harmonic function. And so you can think of these Liouville quantum gravity surfaces as being like a certain natural perturbation of, uh, of the flat metric. Um, but the story in reality is actually quite a bit more complicated than that, because uh, the h that we're exponentiating here um, it's actually not um, a function. It's a random variable which takes values in the space of distributions. And that comes because this uh, covariance function, it blows up when x gets close to y. And so this random field actually has uh, infinite variance at points. And this is why there's a lot of really interesting mathematics that goes into to studying these, these surfaces. Um, OK, so let me tell you a little bit about how one makes sense of these things. Um, so the, the easiest thing to understand rigorously in the context of this random um, Ramanian metric is its volume form. And, and so basically what you do is you sort of follow your nose um, where when you're presented with this type of problem where you're, uh, you've got a distribution, uh, so you've got this exponential of the Gaussian free field. So you just take your, your distribution and you smooth it and you can do this in basically any way that you want, but it turns out that one very nice way to smooth the Gaussian free field is just to, um, to look at its averages on circles, and that gives you a continuous approximation. And then um, it turns out that it's not uh, terribly difficult to show that 
um, the associated volume measure with the Gaussian free field replaced by its approximation uh, converges in the limit to a, a random measure. Um, and when you take this kind of limit, you have to introduce uh, an extra correction. That's the epsilon to the gamma squared over two because uh, the variance of your approximations is blowing up. And so this is what you have to put in so that you get something which has uh, a finite mean and so a non-trivial non limit. Um, and these, these random measures that come from exponentiating the, the Gaussian free field, they've appeared in you know, lots of different works, uh, going back to work of, of Hook Krohn. Um, and then later in the 1980s, there's a, a whole theory of something called Gaussian multiplicative chaos, which is uh, due to Kahan. And then uh, this topic was really popularized uh, in the probability literature by Duplante and Sheffield in a paper which came out in the archive uh, back in 2008. Um, but I think that they were giving lots of talks about this um, several years beforehand. Um, so, th so it turns out that it's not so difficult to build a, a random measure, um, but it turns out that it's more challenging to construct uh, the associated metric. So this is the, not the Ramanian metric, but the, the distance function. Um, and the difference between um, the volume form and the distance function is that uh, area is, is a local feature, whereas uh, the metric is a global feature. So if you want to calculate the distance between two points, you have to perform an optimization problem, which depends on a lot of information. Um, but this is something which is of interest uh, to do because um, the, if you want to make a connection to random planar maps, then the natural structure that you have for a planar map is its distance function. And so we want to have a distance function here um, as well. Um, okay. So, um, so now let me tell you about um, one of the ways in which the two different things I've talked about are supposed to be connected to each other. Um, so it had been believed for a while that in a certain sense, the Brownian map, which is the scaling limit of random quadrangulations, should be the same thing as Levo quantum gravity, where the parameter uh, gamma is this magical value of the square root of eight thirds. And one way of thinking about that is you can look at um, what's called the embedding problem. And um, you can take, uh, say, a random quadrangulation, and, and then you can try to embed it into the uh, plane in, in a nice way. Um, and nice here means some kind of uh, embedding which is related to conformal mapping. Um, so there are lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, one way which is nice to look at, which I've done in the slide here, is you can, you can perform a circle packing of your graph. Um, you can also perform various discrete, other discrete forms of uniformization. Um, if you view the faces as actually corresponding to uh, copies of the unit square, you can do you know, the actual Riemann uniformization. Um, and, then, and then you've got something which is defined in the, the plane, like this over here. And then you can try to compare that with Lievo quantum gravity, which is you know, a random Riemannian metric, which is defined in the plane. And in particular, um, it was believed to be true that um, when you take a limit, this, this, this does converge to the Lievo quantum, quantum gravity. One way of formulating that is to say that the, the area measure, which is naturally defined on this right-hand side, where, for example, each circle gets one an equal amount of mass, converges to the Lievo quantum gravity um, volume form. Um, and these kinds of embeddings are, are interesting to understand because uh, part of the motivation for studying these random surfaces is that we want to compare um, statistical mechanics models like Brownian motion on random surfaces and in Euclidean space. And so in order to do that, you have to put them into the same space and, and look at an embedding um, of this type. Um, okay, so the, the first theorem now that I want to mention, um, this is uh, part of some joint work with, uh, with Scott Sheffield. Uh, this was from about six years or so ago. And, um, and what we, we did is we figured out you know, some way of associating with Lievo quantum gravity when gamma is the square root of eight thirds, uh, a metric space structure. And, and then we proved that the resulting metric space is the same thing as the, as the Brownian metric. 
And um, the, the way that it worked is it, it didn't have anything to do with uh, taking the, um, this formal expression here and trying to regularize the Gaussian free field and taking a limit. Uh, it was actually quite an indirect construction, which somehow um, involved figuring out um, uh, how to define metric balls inside of this space, and then showing that you know the conjectural metric balls actually correspond to metric balls in in, in a real metric space. Um, and somehow this is connected to various growth models that people study in probability, like there's something called the Eden model, or or possibly you've heard of uh, diffusion limited aggregation. Um, and let me show you uh, a picture of what this looks like. Um, so this is a, a metric ball in square root eight thirds lethal quantum gravity. Um, and the different colors here uh, indicate what this metric ball looks like at, at different radii. Uh, so this, this shows what it looks like as you, uh, as you increase the radius. And then superimposed on top of it, uh, I've drawn um, geodesics, uh, which start from uh, points in a grid and go back to the center of the metric ball, which is uh, this point uh, here. And one of the things that you see, which turns out to be very useful for proving things about um, medieval quantum gravity metrics or actually planar maps and many different things is what's called the confluence of geodesics phenomenon. So if you, um, if you take two different points in this grid, um, like maybe this point and this point, and you follow the geodesics back to the center point of the, uh, of the metric ball, then what's going to happen is they're actually going to meet each other and they're going to coalesce and they form this, um, they form this tree structure. And somehow the reason that that happens is a reflection of the fact that we're working with a, a fractal object, which has lots of mountains and valleys and geodesics somehow want to go through the valleys. And when they're constrained to do that, they, they coalesce. Um, and in terms of these, um, these metrics, this is sort of where things stood for, uh, for several years. Um, until a little bit more uh, recently, where it was figured out how to construct the metric for Liouville quantum gravity for uh, the entire range of values of gamma uh, between zero and two. And this uh, uh, second series of works was actually based on uh, trying to take a limit of uh, regularized metrics in a very direct way, which is something which is, you know, perhaps a bit more, more natural to try. And so um, these uh, approximations for this metric, they have a name. For some reason, they're called Liouville first passage percolation. And what you do, again, is you just take your Gaussian free field and you smooth it in some nice way so that you have a real uh, metric. And then you can uh, calculate the distance between two points by solving the optimization problem of finding the shortest path. Um, one sort of subtle thing is that the exponent that you plug in here when you calculate these distances is not uh, what it would be for a normal Ramanian manifold. It's something a little bit different. And that's, again, a reflection of the fact that this is a, a fractal, fractal object. Um, and so um, the way that the story worked in this more general context is um, uh, first, uh, again, like for random planar maps, uh, people figured out how to prove a compactness result. Uh, so there was first a work of uh, Ding and Dunlap. So Ding, who used to be at the University of Chicago, and I think Alex was an undergraduate there, Alex Dunlap. They, they figured out how to show that you have uh, subsequential limits for these approximations when the value of gamma is small, which means it's supposed to be a small perturbation of the flat metric. Um, then this was improved upon uh, by uh, Julian Dubedat and Hugo Falconet where they again proved a compactness result for small values of gamma, but the range of gamma values was a bit more explicit. And they also had some other very nice features uh, of their argument that really did make this an improvement upon the original Ding Dunlap paper. Um, and then a bit more recently, I think this was around the end of 2018, uh, Ding and Dunlap wrote another paper where they, they managed to prove compactness, but now for the entire range of gamma values. Um, and this, this first work was actually with a different approximation scheme, which is very nice, but not quite as nice as just trying to calculate shortest paths with respect to uh, a regularized metric. 
And, and then uh, what happened is that these two teams uh, got together. Um, and then in around May or so 2019, uh, they, they managed to prove this compactness result for um, the full range of gamma values uh, between zero and two using um, this, this very natural uh, approximation scheme um, here. And then um, this gives you the existence of a subsequential limit. Uh, and then uh, Ewan and I had a work uh, where we showed that um, these uh, subsequential limits actually exist as, as true limits. And so you really do have a canonical uh, distance function that you can associate with Liouville quantum gravity. And so in this case, this value gamma equals the square root of eight thirds uh, actually was not special at all. You don't somehow see it. But part of the way that we uh, prove the existence of this limit is by showing that it's characterized by a certain list of axioms, um, which are satisfied by the, the metric previously constructed when gamma is the square root of eight thirds. And that's how you can see that, um, that these objects are, um, are the same. Okay. And again, you know, the reason that one wants to build these metrics, or at least one of them, is that this is one thing that you can use to make connections to various types of random planar maps. So not just uniformly random planar maps, but there are lots of different variants that you can consider um, as well. Um, now, um, let me um, say a few words about um, embedding these, uh, these surfaces um, back into the plane. So if you have, um, the equivalence between square root eight thirds Liouville quantum gravity in the Brownian map. So remember the Brownian map is just an abstract metric measure space. It gives you a way to embed the uh, Brownian map into the plane, but it's not an explicit embedding. Um, it's unexplicit. And, um, but if you're a probabilist, um, you know, constructing an embedding of a metric space, which has the topology of the sphere, this is equivalent to trying to build a Brownian motion on your, uh, on your, your metric space. Okay, so if you want to construct an embedding, you just have to figure out how do you build Brownian motion in an intrinsic way. And um, there's a natural way to do this if you have a metric measure space. Namely, um, what you can do is you, you have your, your surface, which let me indicate with this, this domain here, and then you can uh, pick a bunch of random points using your measure, and you get something which is called a Poisson point process. And, and then you can use your points to build a graph approximation of your, um, your surface by forming the Voronoi tessellation. So you look at the, uh, the cells inside the, the surface where each cell consists of the points which are closest to the points which are closest to um, any given point in your original, uh, your original point process. And this gives you a graph approximation of your surface because you can just say that uh, adjacent cells are adjacent in this graph. And then the way that you can build the Brownian motion is you can consider simple random walk on this graph. And um, this is a picture of what this actually looks like in practice um, in the case of square root eight thirds Liouville quantum gravity. And, um, and then one of the other results um, that uh, came out of work with, with Ewan and, and Scott Sheffield is that if you consider simple random walk on this graph approximation of the Brownian map, then it converges to a continuous process, which you can say is the Brownian motion on the Brownian map. And this is a way of inducing uh, a conformal embedding. Um, now, this is not the only approach to this problem. Uh, there's a, a different approach, uh, which is actually very, very different um, for embedding you know, the same types of planar maps uh, into the plane, uh, which is based on uh, percolation um, and its relationship with, with harmonic measure and Brownian motion. And this was something which is developed in uh, a separate series of works by, uh, by Nina Holden and, uh, and Shin Sun. Okay, so... Um, so now I've told you about these two different types of uh, random surfaces. Uh, now what I want to do is I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the tools that one uses to prove things about them and some of the applications of these types of results. And this brings us to another topic, which is uh, the Schramm-Love revolution.
Um, so now I'm going to start afresh. Um, so the Schramm Love Revolution is a, a type of random curve that you can consider in the plane. And it describes um, the limits of interfaces in different types of discrete models. Um, so here on the right hand side, I've drawn um, what's called a, um, a percolation configuration on the hexagonal lattice. So here the hexagons are either black or red uh, with probability a half. And, um, and then I've put boundary conditions here where I've got all black hexagons on this side and all red hexagons on this side. And the reason for doing that is that then you will have an interface, which is this green path, which goes between the black, uh, black cluster attached to the left side and the red cluster attached to the right hand side. And, and then you can try to understand, you know, what is the limit of this interface when the hexagons get smaller and smaller. And um, this is one of the motivations that uh, led Schramm to construct this schramm leuven revolution. And basically what he realized is that in the case of percolation and many other discrete models, um, if you want to understand these interfaces, there, there are really only two things that matter. So one is that um, somehow the limiting curve should somehow behave well when you apply conformal transformations because physicists believe that many of these models would be conformally invariant in the limit. And um, it should also uh, satisfy a certain Markov property, um, which basically refers to the fact that, you know, if you're an ant and you're kind of exploring one of these uh, discrete models, you know, you don't really learn much about uh, what's going on other than in the area that you're exploring. And what you realized is that, you know, if you impose some very minor conditions, just these two conditions, there's really not that much choice. There's just a one parameter family of curves. And this is, um, this is what SLE kappa is. And this kappa, uh, like gamma, for level quantum gravity sort of tells you uh, how rough your curve is going to be. So when kappa is small, uh, it's not very windy. It's not very rough. And when kappa gets bigger and bigger, the curves get uh, more and more fractal-like. And um, it gives you a curve which is a simple curve when kappa is small, so when kappa is between zero and four, um, it becomes self-intersecting, um, but not space filling when this value of kappa is between four and eight, and then you get a random space filling curve when kappa is bigger than eight. Um, you can also calculate the Hausdorff dimension of these curves, and um, you have lots of very special kappa values, which turn out to correspond to uh, different discrete models, like the percolation model that I've just described, uh, turns out to correspond to kappa equal to um, six. Um, okay, and I want to just take a moment to explain how this SLE is defined because it's something which I think is very interesting. Um, so the, the starting point for it is something uh, which was developed in complex analysis back in the 1920s by Lovner to solve a completely different type of problem. So not a probability problem, a complex analysis problem. And it's a way of encoding uh, curves in the upper half plane by a simpler piece of information, namely a, just a continuous real valued function. And so the basic idea is that if you have a curve in the upper half plane, you can imagine that you grow it up to some time t. And, and then when you do that, you can look at the complement of the curve and you can conformally map the complement back to the upper half plane. Now, of course, you're going to have lots of choices of conformal map, but you can fix the choice by assuming that it looks like the identity at infinity. So it means that this property holds. And then there's just going to be a unique conformal map. And then the theorem is that this, this sort of flow of conformal maps, which you get as you, um, as you uh, grow your curve, is going to satisfy a very nice differential equation, which is this one here. And the input into the differential equation is this function wt, which is just the, turns out to be the image of the tip of the curve at time t. Um, but anyway, the point is that you take a complicated object, which is a planar curve, and you encode it in terms of something simple, which is a, a real valued function. So something which has a smaller dimension. And what Schramm realized is that if you impose these um, constraints of conformal invariance in this Markov property, then if you encode your curve using the Lovner equation, then the W has to be a multiple of a Brownian motion. Um, and this is something which is really nice because probabilists have lots of tools for understanding um, 
smooth functions of Brownian motion. So you have this theory of stochastic calculus. Um, okay. Now, let me go back to percolation for a second. So I said a little bit about it before, but let me, um, let me uh, take a few steps back and tell you a little bit about its history. Um, so it was introduced into the mathematics literature by um, these two people, by Hammersley and Welsh back in 1957, although some people even say it's actually much older than that. And uh, it was supposed to be a mathematical model which describes how fluid, I'm oh, sorry, how, um, how gas, poisonous gas, uh, either flows or hopefully does not flow through the filter of a gas mask. And there are lots of variants of percolation, um, but the standard setting is that you have a graph like this bit of uh, Z2 here, and you, um, and then what you do is you pick a random subgraph by fixing a parameter between zero and one. And, and then you decide to keep each edge independently by flipping a coin, which is heads with probability P or tails with probability um, one minus P. And then what you're interested in are the connectivity properties of this resulting graph because that's supposed to tell you whether or not fluid or gas can flow or can't flow. And the first thing that you want to do is you want to calculate um, what the critical value is. Um, so this is the value where you have the most interesting behavior. And the way it's defined is that if you include edges with a higher probability than the critical probability, you're going to get an infinite cluster and below which you're going to get uh, finite clusters. And, and then what you want to do is you want to calculate things like what is the probability that two uh, vertices are connected by uh, a path of open edges. And, and then you can try to understand the scaling limit of, the, uh, of these clusters. And if you do this in the plane on Z2, uh, then you get a picture which maybe looks like this one. So this is uh, an instance of critical uh, percolation on Z2, um, which turns out to correspond to probability a half. And what you see is a 1,000 by 1,000 box where the black, the black stuff uh, corresponds to the cluster, which is connected to the boundary by paths of open edges. And um, the reason that you see a disk actually rather than a box is that when I made this, I thought it was aesthetically more pleasing if it was conformally mapped to the mapped to the disk. Okay, and these are the types of, of random fractals that you see when you take scaling limits of, of percolation. And when you do percolation on planar lattices, um, there are you know lots of results which are known. Um, so some of the basic but very important ones are that the critical probability is a half for bond percolation on Z2, which means that you're either keeping or tossing out edges with probability a half. Um, another uh, setting is you can look at site percolation on the triangular lattice. Um, and it turns out that in this case, the critical probability is also uh, equal to a half. So in this setting, rather, rather than keeping or throwing out edges, you're coloring hexagons, uh, either black or red. And then um, one of the, uh, very famous results uh, in this area is due to Smirnoff, where he looked at this uh, critical percolation interface. Um, so in this setting here, where I put these boundary conditions to force the existence of an interface between the, the black uh, hexagons and the uh, red hexagons. And he proved that this interface converges in the limit to um, an SLE six curve. And, um, and his proof is somehow very reliant on the fact that you're working on the hexagonal lattice. And so a problem that's been around for a while is whether or not um, it's possible to look at another planar lattice, like let's say the square lattice and do bond percolation and still get convergence of the interface to SLE6, which is what's supposed to be true. Um, okay, but one can um, also look at percolation on other types of graphs, like random planar maps. And, um, and you can ask, you know, the same sorts of questions. So you can calculate the critical probability. Um, and if you do it for what's called site percolation on a triangulation, which means that you're coloring the vertices either red or blue, let's say with, um, then the critical probability is a half. Uh, this was determined by Omer Angel. Um, another model, another variant is you can consider what's called face percolation on a random quadrangulation. And this means that you color the faces either uh, red or blue, um, 
where let's say blue is with probability three quarters and red is with probability uh, one quarter. And you think of the blue faces as somehow being open and the red faces as being closed. And the reason that you have this uh, asymmetry, so the critical probability is not a half, is that it's harder for uh, open faces to be adjacent. And so you need more of them in order to, to form uh, an infinite cluster. Um, and actually, there's a, many different results kind of of this type where you can look at different types of random planar maps and you can, you can compute what the, uh, what the critical probability is. Um, and so because um, the scaling limit results for random planar maps are in some situations quite a bit nicer if you work with quadrangulations rather than other types of planar maps, uh, I'm going to focus um, in this uh, last little bit on uh, this particular model of face percolation at a random quadrangulation. And, and one final result that I want to mention is you can look at a random quadrangulation, but now with the topology of the disk, which means that you have boundary. And, and then you can color um, the uh, faces to be either open or closed, so uh, blue or red with probability three quarters. And, and then you can impose boundary conditions, uh, just like in uh, the case of um, the uh, hexagonal lattice. So we have open and closed boundary conditions so that we have this uh, unique interface which um, separates the open squares from the, the closed squares. And, and now this is a very different setting than say what Smirnoff considered in the triangular lattice because we're not looking at an embedded graph here. This is um, a statement about just some random graph which is not embedded. And so I want to view this as uh, a random path, which is living in a random metric space. And uh, this last theorem that I want to mention is that, and this is again with, uh, with Hewen, is that we showed that uh, this interface converges in the limit as a, as a you know, path in a metric space rather than as an embedded path to um, one of these SLE curves on square root eight thirds Liouville quantum gravity. And this kind of thing is interesting because you know, this, um, when, you, when you prove that you get the same type of limiting object on a random surface as you did when you considered a deterministic graph like the hexagonal lattice, you can start to, uh, you know, make sense of some of these ideas of physicists who were trying to make comparisons between these types of statistical mechanics models on random surfaces versus uh, the plane. And one thing which is a bit different from um, some Smirnoff's work is that this is something which is not really that sensitive in some sense to the underlying model. Uh, this turns out to work for many, many different types of random planar maps. Once you check a few things, there's just sort of a black box which tells you that the scaling limit has to be one of these um, SLE curves. Um, okay, so now um, let, me, um, let me finish by just making uh, a few final words. Um, so I talked a lot about Liouville quantum gravity, which is what you get when you exponentiate the Gaussian free field. And if you take the parameter gamma to be the square root of eight thirds, then what you get uh, corresponds to a planar map chosen uniformly at random. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you can understand these uh, random, you know, Riemannian manifolds with other values of gamma. And these are also very important because they turn out to correspond to random planar map models with some extra structure. Uh, so, for example, rather than just picking a planar map uniformly at random, you can pick a pair that consists of a planar map together with a spanning tree, and then you're going to get a different value of gamma. Uh, so somehow this will bias the law of your surface, and it turns out that you get gamma equal to the square root of two. And there are lots of other um, variants of this where you can get uh, other values of gamma, which are all of, all of interest. Um, but a lot less is known about these uh, surfaces when, um, when gamma is not the square root of eight thirds. So one question which has been a persistent gap in the literature is that we don't know what the dimension of the underlying space is supposed to be. So when gamma is the square root of eight thirds, it's a four dimensional space. But for other values of gamma, we don't know. Um, there a, was a prediction which was made by physicists back in the 1990s by this person called Wadabiki. And he wrote down this formula for what the dimension could be. And it's correct when gamma is the square root of eight thirds, you get four. It's also correct when gamma is equal to zero and you get two. 
Um, but it turns out that it's not correct for other values of gamma. So this is something that was disproved by uh, John Ding and uh, together with uh, Goswami. Um, but since then, there have been lots of uh, improved bounds uh, for what the dimension should be. So they're very tight error bars now, but we still don't have, have a formula. Um, and, and then let me finish by mentioning, you know, what I've, I've talked about here, this is actually just a very small slice of what's a very big topic of looking at the exponential of the Gaussian free field. Um, so one other sort of direction, which has been very active, especially in the last few years, is uh, calculating correlation functions. So basically what this means is you can take your Liouville quantum gravity surface, then you can fix a few points, and then you can ask how is the behavior of the surface correlated at these points. And there's a, an amazing formula called the DOZZ formula. Um, it's amazing that you can actually find a formula for this, which describes what happens when you have three points. Um, and this is something that was you know, conjectured in the physics literature back in the early 2000s, I think, and just proved rigorously by these uh, mathematicians uh, Kupiain and Rhodes and Vargas. And, and then more recently, they've established something called the conformal bootstrap, which is a way of calculating these correlation functions, uh, not just for three marked points, but for more marked points. And somehow you start with the case of three points, and then you can build on that and, and, and go further and further. Um, and there are lots of other connections with, with other things. Uh, for example, the Levo quantum gravity measure turns out to be very much connected with the behavior of random walk. Um, so basically what this refers to is you can imagine that you have a bit of graph like, uh, like Z2, um, maybe a square inside of Z2, and you can, you can run a random walk until it visits every vertex, and then you can look at the profile of um, how many times different vertices have been visited, and it turns out that if you set things up properly, this is described by the Liouville quantum gravity measure. Um, there are also lots of connections with random matrices, because if you take various random matrix models, somehow the fluctuations of the eigenvalues, or maybe the log of the characteristic function, they turn out to be described by uh, various uh, log-correlated uh, Gaussian fields. And so if you look at, say, the characteristic function itself, you're going to get the exponential of a Gaussian field, and that will be, um, that will be the, the Liouville quantum gravity measure. And there are... Um, lots of other things uh, like this that are currently going on um, in, in the research in this, uh, this topic. Um, okay, so that's, that's everything that I wanted to say. Uh, and so I will, I will stop there and, and, and thanks a lot for, for listening.